the Logical Association 1986 Annual Meeting. This is session number 171 29786, Divisions 28, 2, 6, 15, and 25, Invited Address. Whatever happened to psychology as a science of behavior? The presenter, B.F. Skinner. The featured speaker in this session is Professor B.F. Skinner. I am Stephanie Stoltz, the president of Division 25, the Division of the Experimental Analysis of Behavior. My division shares with Division 28, Psychopharmacology, the major sponsorship of this session. Other divisions joining us in sponsoring Professor Skinner's talk are Divisions 2, the Teaching Psychology, 6, Physiological and Comparative, and 15, Educational Psychology. I'm greatly honored to have the opportunity to introduce Professor Skinner to you. I believe he is one of a very small number of people whose ideas have widely influenced the behavior of people living in this century. I was born in 1938, the year of publication of Professor Skinner's book, The Behavior of Organisms. So I don't know a world that didn't know Professor Skinner. Professor Skinner's research, as reported at length in that book, marked the founding of the scientific discipline of the experimental analysis of behavior. The focus of the experimental analysis of behavior is on an understanding of organisms in the interactions with a responsive environment. Professor Skinner's research and the research of his students and others following the behavioral approach is changing how people speak about themselves. Professor Skinner gave us a view of the nature of the human organism that changes how we behave in our daily lives and a methodological tool that has made it possible to increase our understanding of the laws of behavior and to give significant help to the needy of the world. Using the worldview, methodology, and approach to analysis that Professor Skinner originated, psychologists are experimentally analyzing fundamental behavior problems and significant social issues. A sample of the resulting work can be found in the Division 25 program at this convention. Today, Professor Skinner will address the question, whatever happened to psychology as a science of behavior? Fred? Gentlemen, did you all hear her easily? I want to check up on, on audio. I've, I've given papers here, and then afterward, someone has said, the trouble was I couldn't hear you very well. And that's not a reinforcing comment. Uh, <laughs> uh, as anyone, I will probably be about in this position, and I will look down at my manuscript and back up. And is, is, is it coming through all right? No complaints. All right. There can scarcely be any subject matter more familiar than human behavior. We are always in the presence of at least one behaving person. Can there be anything more important, whether it is our own behavior, or of those with whom we deal every day, or those who are responsible for what is going on in the world at large? Nevertheless, it is certainly not the thing we understand best. Granted that it is possibly the most difficult subject ever submitted to scientific analysis, it is still puzzling that so little has been done with the instruments and methods which have proved so successful in the other sciences. One possible explanation is that for thousands of years, behavior has been regarded as the mere expression or symptom of more important things going on inside the behaving person. The Homeric Greeks thought they knew the very organs. Phrenes was one of them. The thumos, or heart, was another. It was a vital organ. When it stopped, you died. But for the Greeks, it was also the seat of such things as hunger, fear, will, and thought. To be undecided about something was to have a divided thumos. We may smile at that, but we do much the same thing. Here are some of the definitions of heart 
in Webster's Third International Dictionary. It can mean the whole personality, deep in one's heart, intelligence, knowing something by heart, opinion, a change of heart, affection, a broken heart, goodwill, with all my heart, courage, a stout heart, and taste, a man after one's own heart. Of course, we don't mean the real heart, but the Greeks may not have done so either. The point is, like them, we refer to something inside the person to explain what that person does. When Galen discovered the anatomy of the human body in greater detail, especially the nerves connecting the brain with sense organs and muscles, it was clear that the Greeks had got the wrong organ. They should have said brain. It was Descartes who showed how the brain and the nerves could explain the kind of behavior that was later called reflex. Although the stimulus in the reflex suggested an external cause, the search for internal causes did not stop. During the 19th and early 20th century, reflexes were studied by physiologists. Sherrington's book was called The Inter Integrative Action of the Nervous System, and Pavlov's had the subtitle The Physiological Activity of the Cerebral Cortex. It is hard to find plausible organs for many kinds of behavior, of course, and Plato and others gave up the attempt. Speculation could then flourish more abundantly. Although we think we see the object we are looking at, for example, it was said that we must see only an internal copy of it, since we can still see it with our eyes shut and even recall it from memory later on. Before we act, moreover, we can merely think of acting. We can have intentions, expectations, ideas, and so on, and do nothing more about them. Somewhere inside the body, in short, there seems to be another person made of a different kind of stuff. For 2,500 years, philosophers and psychologists have discussed the nature of that stuff. But for our present purposes, we may accept Punch's famous dismissal. What is matter? Never mind. What is mind? No matter. <laughs> mind or matter. It is something inside a person which makes that person go. The theory of evolution raised a different question about those internal causes. Non-human animals had reflexes and organs but did they have minds? Darwin, concerned with the continuity of species, said yes. And he and his contemporaries could cite examples that seemed to prove him right. It was Lloyd Morgan who objected that the examples could be explained in other ways, and Watson who took the inevitable next step and contended that the same thing could be said of human animals too. An early form of behaviorism was born. The predilection for internal causes survived, probably as a reaction to the heavily mentalistic psychology of the time, the existence of consciousness was a central issue in early behaviorism. Experiments were designed to show that animals either could or could not do everything traditionally attributed to feelings or state of mind. If they could not, something like a mental life would have to be recognized. Perhaps because Watson first studied instincts, he replaced feelings and states of mind with habits. He may have meant nothing more than the behavior said to show their existence, but he turned later to conditioned reflexes, and his associate Lashley went still further into the nervous system. Later, Tolman put purpose back into the organism, and still later, cognitive maps and hypotheses. Clark Hall built an elaborate system of intervening processes which, as for example, afferent neural interaction became increasingly physiological. In short, three
3,000 years after the Homeric Greeks, psychologists and behaviorists alike were still looking inside the organism for explanations of its behavior. To say that the habit must have been deeply ingrained would be to give another example. Behavior seems to have been first accepted as a subject matter in its own right when the organisms studied were too small or their behavior too simple to suggest internal initiating processes. H.S. Jennings, The Behavior of the Lower Organisms was the great classic course, but more to the point were the work and theories of Jacques Loeb. His formulation of tropisms and his emphasis on forced movement dispensed with internal explanations. It was said, in fact, of Loeb that he resented the nervous system. <laughs> the thing to be studied was the behavior of the organism as a whole. Equally important were new developments in the philosophy of science. The concepts began to be more carefully defined in terms of the operations from which they were inferred. Ernst Mach, especially with his science mechanics, was an important figure. Later in America, P.W. Bridgman took a similar line in his Logic of Modern Physics. In a book called Philosophy, said to have been written as a potboiler, Bertrand Russell anticipated the logical positivist by several years and behavioristically considered a number of important topics. My thesis, the concept of the reflex in description of behavior, was in that tradition. A reflex, I argued, was not something that went on inside the organism. It was a law of behavior. All we actually observed was that a response was a function of a stimulus. It could also be a function of variables in the fields of conditioning, motivation, and emotion, but they too were outside the organism. I call them third variables, but Tolman later put them back inside and called them intervening. It was easy to make my case because reflexes, conditioned or unconditioned, compose only a small part of the behavior of an organism. The research I was doing at the time had a broader aspect, however. The environment not only triggered behavior, it selected it. The consequences, indeed, seemed to be more important than antecedents. Their role, of course, had long been recognized, for example, as reward or punishment. And it was Thorndike who first studied their effects experimentally. Given several possible ways of solving a problem, a cat eventually took the successful one when incorrect ways or errors dropped out. I studied the same process, but in a different way. Prompted by Pavlov's emphasis on the concept of conditions, on the, con on the control, of con control of conditions, I made sure that all Thorndike's errors had been eliminated before a successful response could be made. A single reinforcing consequence was then enough. The response was immediately and rapidly repeated. I called the process operant conditioning, of course. Thorndike had attributed his effect to feelings of satisfaction and annoyance, which were, of course, inside the organism. But I traced the strengthening effect of an operant reinforcer to its survival value in the natural selection of the species. My first arrangements of setting response and consequence were quite simple, but increasingly complex contingencies of reinforcement have been studied for more than 50 years in laboratories throughout the world. Most of the work has been done with non-human animals, primarily in order to cover a wider range of conditions that would be, than would be feasible with human subjects and to avoid verbal contamination. The contamination has also been studied, however. Verbal behavior differs from nonverbal only in certain features of the contingencies of reinforcement. The difference is important. The verbal stimuli we call advice, rules, or laws describe or allude to contingencies of reinforcement. 
when advice has been given or rules and laws formulated, people may, have, may behave for two very different reasons. Their behavior have, may have more direct, may have been more directly reinforced by its consequences, or they may be indirectly responding to descriptions of the contingencies. The verbal contingencies also bring the important fields of psychology within range of an operant analysis. Behavior analysts do not ignore consciousness, nor have they brought mental events back into their science. They have simply analyzed the verbal contingencies which bring private events into control of the perceptual behavior called introspecting or feeling. It is only when we are asked about what we have done or are going to do and why that we observe or recall our behavior and some of its controlling variables. Until we have done so, we are unconscious of our behavior. But we have no reason to say that the unconscious is a place in which strange things happen or that consciousness is a state of mind. Other kinds of verbal contingencies generate the behavior we call self-management or thinking, especially when we solve problems by manipulating rules rather than contingencies of reinforcement. Much of such an analysis is at the moment only an interpretation. Just as astronomers interpret the waves and particles reaching the Earth from outer space, with what has been learned about much, under much more favorable circumstances in the laboratory, especially in high energy physics, so we use what has been learned from the experimental analysis of behavior to explain what people do under conditions which cannot be comparably controlled. There is a curious parallel with the history of the study of innate behavior. Pathologists no longer watch what animals do primarily to discover their feelings, insights, or characters. Instead, they look for the contribution which their behavior makes to natural selection. Similarly, research on operant behavior is not designed to find evidence of internal processes, either mental or physiological, but to study the effect of a different selective consequence, operant reinforcement. The preoccupation with internal explanatory agents has, so to speak, broken behavior into fragments. Psychophysicists, for example, study the effects of stimuli, but only up to the point at which they are supposedly received by an inner agent. Psycholinguists record changes in the number of words or the length of sentences the child speaks over a period of time, but usually with no record of what happened when the child heard similar words or sentences, or of what consequences followed when the words or sentences were spoken. Psychologists who study verbal learning ask their subjects to memorize and recall nonsense syllables, but the very word nonsense makes it clear that they're not interested in meaningful episodes of behavior. Somehow, the internal entity or process has acted as a starting or stopping place. A bit of sensing is studied by one psychologist, a bit of behaving by another, and a bit of changing by still another. The experimental analysis of behavior puts Humpty Dumpty together again by studying relatively complete episodes, each with a history of reinforcement, a current setting, a response, and a reinforcing consequence. Many of the facts, and even some of the principles which psychologists have discovered when they thought they were discovering something else, are useful, however. We can accept, for example, what psychophysicists tell us about responses to stimuli without agreeing that they show a mathematical relation between the mental and the physical. We can accept many of the facts reported by cognitive psychologists without believing that their subjects are processing information or storing representations and rules. We can accept the results of research in which subjects respond to descriptions of schedules of reinforcement without believing that they are, quote, subjectively evaluating expected utilities, unquote. It is at this point that an analysis of behavior 
offers an attractive alternative to traditional explanations which appeal to feelings, states of mind, or traits of character. The analysis has reached into almost every branch of traditional psychology. Yet it has not become psychology, and the question is why not? At least part of the answer may be found in three formidable obstacles which have lain in his path. Obstacle one, humanistic psychology. <laughs> Many people find the implications of a behavioral analysis disturbing. It seems to reverse the traditional directive action of organism and environment. Instead of saying that the organism sees, attends to, perceives processes, or otherwise act upon stimuli, it says that stimuli acquire control of behavior because of the part they play in the contingencies of reinforcement. Instead of saying that an organism stores copies of the contingencies to which it is exposed and later retrieves and responds to them again, it says that the organism is changed by the contingencies and later responds as a changed organism, the contingencies having passed into history. In other words, the environment takes over the control formerly assigned to an internal originating agent. Other features of human behavior long admired also seem challenged. A creative mind is one casualty. Following the lead of evolutionary theory, an operant analysis replaces creation with variation and selection. There is no longer any reason, play any place for a plan or for purpose or goal-directedness. Just we do not say that species-specific behavior evolved in order that a species could adapt to the environment, but evolved when it adapted. So we say that operant behavior is not strengthened by reinforcement in order that the individual can adjust to the environment, but is strengthened when the individual adjusts. The replacement of an internal creator seems to threaten personal freedom. Can we be free if the environment controls us? And also in the sense of personal worth, can we take credit for our achievements if they are merely the products of fortunate circumstances? Still another threat is to ethical, religious, and governmental systems which hold people responsible for their action. Who or what is responsible if unethical, immoral, or, or illegal behavior is due to heredity, personal history, or irresistible circumstances. Humanistic psychologists have attacked behavior analysis along these lines. Unlike creationists, they have not tried to suppress facts or stop inquiry, but when they call behavioral science Machiavellian or said that it manipulates people or treats them like objects, they have much the same effect. A science so characterized is less likely to find support or to attract young people as a career. People sometimes protest the fact that their behavior is controlled as they protest the fact that they will die. But the struggle for freedom or dignity has almost always been a struggle against certain types of control rather than the general fact. Escaping from physical restraint or punishment has had survival value for the species and is therefore part of the human genetic endowment. Having escaped, people feel free. But behavior is equally controlled when it has been positively reinforced. But people then feel free and do not tend to escape unless aversive consequences follow for some other reason. It is not freedom, but the feeling of freedom that matters. Personal worth and responsibility can be analyzed in, this, in the same way. Praise and blame are social practices maintained by cultures because of their effects and have nothing to do with whether behavior is determined. The science of behavior can tell us how to build a world in which people will feel freer and worthier 
and behave in better ways than ever before. In its opposition to such a science, humanistic psychology may be one of the reasons why we are not moving more rapidly in that direction. Obstacle two, psychotherapy. <laughs> certain contingencies, con certain exigencies of the helping professions are another obstacle in the path of a scientific analysis. The psychotherapists must talk with their clients and with rare exceptions must do so in everyday English which is heavy laden with references to internal causes. We say, I ate because I was hungry. I did it because I knew how to do it, and so on. All fields of science tend to have two languages, of course. Scientists speak one with casual acquaintances and the other with colleagues. The differences between them depends upon the age of the science. In a relatively young science, such as psychology, the use of the vernacular may be challenged. How often have behaviorists heard, you just said it crossed my mind, I thought there wasn't supposed to be any mind. Or, but it has been a long time since anyone has challenged a physicist who has said that desk is made of good solid wood by protesting, but I thought you said that matter was mostly empty space. The two languages of psychology raise a special problem, however. What is felt when one is hungry or when one knows how to do something is what physiologists will eventually discover. It is not what they will see when looking at it in another way. Introspective psychologists observe certain states of their bodies in one way, unfortunately defective, Physiologists observe the same thing in a better way. Behavior analysts look at only one part of an episode and leave the rest to the physiologists. References to private events are admittedly often convenient. If we are preparing a meal for a friend, we are not likely to ask, how long has it been since you last ate? Or will you probably eat a great deal? We, we simply ask, how hungry are you? If a friend is driving us to an appointment, we are not likely to ask, have you driven there before? Or has anyone told you where it is? Instead, we ask, do you know where it is? Being hungry and knowing where something is are current effects of personal histories. And what is said about them may be the only available evidence of those histories. Nevertheless, how much a person eats does depend upon a history of deprivation, not upon a deprived body, how a deprived body feels. And whether a person reaches a given destination does depend upon whether he or she has driven there before or has been told how to get there, not upon introspective evidence of any effect. Psychotherapists have to ask people what has happened to them and how they feel about it because the confidential relationship of therapist and client prevents direct inquiry. It is sometimes argued that what a person remembers may be more important than what actually happened, but that is true only if something else has happened of which it would also be better to have independent evidence. But what is said is not very reliable. We do not have very good ways of observing the states of our bodies. We have no nerves going to the right places, and those who teach us to describe them have no way at all. We are taught to say, I'm hungry, for example, by someone who knows perhaps only that we have not eaten for some time. For the continuation, please turn your tape over now. Thank you. says, now you know. But the private states are always poorly correlated with the public evidence. Although the use of reports of feelings and states of mind may often be justified on practical grounds, 
there was no justification at all for their use in theory making. Psychoanalysts, for example, specialize in feelings. Instead of investigating the early lives of their patients or watching them, watching them with their families, friends, or business associates, they ask them what has happened, what they like to do, how they feel, and so on. It is not surprising that they should then construct theories in terms of memories, feelings, and states of mind, or that they should say that an analysis of behavior in terms of environmental histories is lacking in depth. The practical exigencies of the helping professions have obscured another way, have, have, have obscured behavior in another way in which an experimental analysis might move forward more, act more rapidly. Therapists help their clients find a world in which they behave in more effective ways. And they prepare them for such a world by suggesting things to do and describing consequences which may follow. As in cognitive psychology, the result is rule governed rather than contingency shaped behavior. Behavior therapists work in a different way. They strengthen behavior which may prove useful in the client's future by arranging temporary current consequences. As in education, the consequences are seldom those which will later take over and they build the behavior to be, but they build the behavior to be taken over. That difference is important because it leads already directly to prevention rather than remedy, to the design of a world in which fewer people will need help. When Gandhi was asked, what are we to do? He is said to have replied, think of the poorest man you have ever met, and then ask if what you are doing is of any benefit to him. But he must have meant of any benefit to the many people who, without your help, will be like him. To feed the hungry and clothe the naked are remedial acts. We can see what is wrong, what needs to be done. It is much harder to see and to do something about the fact that world agriculture must eventually feed and clothe billions of people, most of them yet unborn. It is not enough merely to advise people how to behave in ways which will make a future for the species possible. They must be given effective reasons for behaving in such ways. And that means that effective contingencies, probably contrived, must be arranged. References to feelings and states of mind also have an appealing emotional tone which behavioral alternatives usually lack, but only to their ultimate advantage. Here is a sample taken from a distinguished publication. If the world is to be saved, men must learn to be noble without being cruel, to be filled with faith, yet open to truth, to be inspired by great purposes without hating those who thwart them. That is an inspiring sentence. We all like nobility, faith, truth, and great purposes, and we dislike cruelty and hatred. But what are we inspired to do? What must, must we change if people are to behave in noble rather than cruel ways? To accept the word of others, but never without questioning it. To do things which have consequences too remote to serve as reinforcers, and to refrain from attacking those who oppose us. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, nor in ourselves that we are underlings. The fault is in our world. It is largely a world we have made, and one we must change if the species is to survive. Now, obstacle three, you can see this coming, cognitive psychology. <laughs> A curve showing the appearance of the word cognitive in the psychological literature would be interesting. The first rise could probably be seen around 1960. The subsequent acceleration would be exponential. Is there any field of psychology today in which something does not seem to be gained by adding that charming adjective to the occasional noun. 
<laughs> the popularity may not be too hard to explain. When we became psychologists, we learned new ways of talking about human behavior. If they were behavioristic, they were not very much like the old ways. The old terms were taboo, and eyebrows were raised when we used them. But when certain developments seemed to show that the old ways might be right after all, everyone relaxed. Mind was back. Information theory was one of those developments, computer technology another. Troublesome problems seemed to vanish like magic. A careful study of sensation and perception was no longer needed. One could simply speak of processing information. It was no longer necessary to construct settings in which to observe behavior. One could simply describe them. Rather than observe what people actually did, one could simply ask them what they would probably do. The cognitive psychologists were looking once again within, inside for, in, in, for internal explanations of behavior. It's clear from the alacrity with which they welcomed support from brain science. They could deny that they were dualists. Brain science would eventually tell them what perceptions, feelings, ideas, and intentions really were. And brain scientists were only too happy to accept the assignment. To complete the account of an episode of behavior, for example, to explain what happens when a reinforcement brings an organism under the control of a given stimulus, is not only beyond the present range of brain science, it would lack the glamour of a revelation about the nature of mind. Cognitive psychologists like to say that the mind is what the brain does. But surely the rest of the body plays a part. The mind is what the body does. It is what the person does. In other words, it is behavior. And that is what behaviorists have been saying for more than half a century. To focus on the brain as an organ is to rejoin the Homeric Greeks in their search for internal causes. Cognitive psychologists and brain scientists have joined to form a new discipline called cognitive science. This is enormously appealing. From a single page in the New York Times book review, we learn that the separation of mind and brain, as represented by the separation of psychiatry and neurology, is now blurring. That biochemistry will tell us about depression, that in dreams, information is processed very differently from in the waking state, that cognitive neuroscientists would not explain forgetting a friend's name as repression, but as a breakdown of memory retrieval, that psychoanalysis was a precursor to current developments in the neurosciences, and that quantum physics offers the most satisfying answer to understanding the mind and brain relationship and the nature of reality itself. Very rich fare, until one counts the calories. <laughs> Damage and repair. There is little doubt that by their very nature, the anti-science stance of humanistic psychology, the practical exigencies of the helping professions, and the cognitive restoration of the royal house of mind have worked against the acceptance of psychology as the science of human behavior. That might be justified if something more valuable had been put in its place. But has that happened? The American Psychological Association has 44 divisions, not only because many branches of the field require separate treatment, but because there are many different conceptions of what psychology is all about. The public is certainly as confused as the profession. Introductory textbooks do not help because with an eye on adoptions, the authors cautiously define psychology as the science of behavior and mental life and make sure that every special field of interest is covered. Has there been an offsetting gain? <coughs> When the journal Psychology Today celebrated its 15th anniversary, it asked 10 psychologists to name the most important discoveries which had been made during its lifetime. As an editorial in the New York Times pointed out, no two of the 10 agreed on a single achievement. 
which could properly be called psychology. As one of those who were asked, I pleaded ignorance of most of the field, but said I was happy with progress in the analysis of behavior. But another contributor claimed that psychology's greatest achievement was its separation from behaviorism. For more than a year, the journal Science has not published a single paper on what could be called psychology. The closest seems to be a long article on memory written by a psychiatrist who took all his data from work on brain-operated or brain-damaged people. Apparently, the editors of science no longer regard psychology as a member of the scientific community. The continuing search for internal determinants of behavior could be much of the trouble. No introspectively perceived feeling or state of mind has ever been unambiguously identified in either mental or physical terms. No ability or trait of character has ever been statistically established to the satisfaction of everyone. And how these things interact with each other is a further question. How do feelings change intentions? How do memories alter decisions? And of course, how does the mind act upon the body and vice versa? These are hoary old questions and they have never been adequately answered. They should never have been asked. <laughs> Behavior is a much simpler subject matter. The key elements, stimulus, response, consequence, are physical events. Their objectivity has been challenged, of course, but the challenges can be answered. A given stimulus may have different effects on different people, but that is true only when it acquired its control from different contingencies of reinforcement. Responses may have different meanings for different people or for one person at different times. But again, the real difference is in the personal history. The lack of a working conception of the behaving individual makes it hard for psychology to form good relations with other sciences. Physiology, for example. As more and more of the behavior of an organism is found to be a function of environmental variables, the organism is emptied of hypothetical initiators, but what remains is not an empty shell. It is the organism studied by physiologists. There, there are inevitable gaps in a behavioral account. Stimulus and response are separated in time and space, for example. <coughs> and so are a reinforcement on one day and observed stronger behavior on the next. The gaps can be filled only with the instruments and methods of physiology. But that is very different from asking physiology, and especially neurology, to tell us what perceptions, ideas, traits of character, and so on really are. Appealing to neurology for help can, in fact, be dangerous. Once you have told the world that another science will explain what your key terms really mean, you must forgive the world if it decides that the more important work is being done by the other science. There is no such danger in a cooperation between behavior analysis and physiology, where each half of a joint venture remains in the hands of those who have the appropriate instruments and methods. A third discipline, of course, such as physiological psychology, can study the relationships between the two. The predilection for internal determiners has also obscured the help psychology could give genetics. genetics. Once you form the noun ability from the adjective able, you are in trouble. Aqua regia has the ability to, to dissolve gold. But chemists will not look for the ability. They will look for molecular processes. Much of the controversy about the heritability of intelligence, schizophrenia, delinquency, and the like arises from the conceptualizing of abilities and traits as explanatory entities. Longevity could be called a, a heritable trait, but rather than try to assign it to a gene, geneticists will look for separate processes, all of which contribute to a long life. The genetics of behavior is much more directly studied by interbreeding organisms which behave in different ways under the controlled conditions of the laboratory. 
Psychology could also be of more help to sociology, anthropology, linguistics, political science, and economics. They are all concerned with the behavior of the same person, but a person of whom psychology offers no useful working conception. Each of the behavioral sciences has its own technical vocabulary, of course, but beyond that, except for brief flirtations with utilitarianism, Marxism, psychoanalysis, and the like, each has turned to the vernacular with all its references to internal causes. The data of the other behavioral sciences are usually much more objective than those of psychology, yet hypothetical causes still flourish. For example, a distinguished political scientist writing in the New York Times recently attributed the alarming number of dishonest practices in American life to a lack of civic virtue and a decline in personal morality. He said nothing about the punitive contingencies responsible for the kinds of behavior from which virtue and morality are inferred. Sciences only slowly discover what they are sciences about. Chemistry in the time of Lavoisier was not much like modern chemistry, but it, if it studied the same substances with the same properties, compositions, and structures, and they underwent the same kinds of changes. Different ways of looking at the substances and at more of them, and different ways of explaining how they change have made the difference. Psychology in the time of Jones and William James was not much like modern psychology, but it studied the same kinds of people interacting with the same kinds of environments. Different ways of looking at what was happening and seeing more of it, and in particular, different ways of explaining it have made the difference. That in particular is important. From the very beginning, those who have tried to explain human behavior have supposed that because they themselves were human beings, they had a privileged access to their inner workings. Physiologists might eventually observe the same things in a different way, but the immediacy of feeling and introspection suggested a different kind of knowledge. It has taken thousands of years to discover the nature and especially the limitations of self-observation. It is time to accept the possibility of explaining behavior in an entirely different way, the way of the other sciences. Once the scope of a behavioral analysis is better understood, that acceptance will not seem so much like a renunciation. Psychology could dispense with many of its traditional problems and open many new opportunities if it, were, if it were to define itself simply as the science of behavior, human behavior if you like. But should it do so? Two groups of psychologists will say no, perhaps with equal vehemence. On the one hand, those for whom psychology will remain forever the science of mind and for whom behavior is at best only an expression or symptom. And on the other hand, those who will declare their independence of the historical discipline and go their own way. Many potential sep separatists argue that a practice of, a, that a science of behavior is really a sort of biology. But of course, that could be said of all the behavioral sciences. They are all concerned with living things. There are several behavioral sciences because people do special things under special circumstances. The general case is the field of psychology. Separatists are often unhappy about the syllable psych. If our subject matter is behavior, why use the Greek word for soul or mind? But one could ask that kind of question of every science. The Greek word fuses is close to, closer to physician than physicist. The astro and astronomy means star, but astronomers are not embarrassed when they speak of black holes or quasars. The geo in geology means earth, but geologists have no trouble with the moon or Mars. New names never solve problems. Electricity comes from the word for, for amber 
which requires an electrostatic charge when rubbed. How many times would electricity have had, how many names would electricity have had if a new one had been invented every time a new property was discovered? <coughs> like all sciences, psychology has many branches, however, and they may need to be named. A chemist may be a crystallographer, for example, and a psychologist, a behavior analyst. The crystallographer remains a chemist and the behavior analyst a psychologist. No matter what philosophers and psychologists have thought or hoped for, human behavior has always been their field. As psychology moves forward as the science of behavior, it may challenge some old and cherished beliefs, as other sciences have done. But if that happens, the beliefs must be reviewed. As the technical vocabulary of such a science moves farther and farther away from the vernacular, problems will arise for those who must use the vernacular in their professional work. But other sciences have solved that problem by carefully distinguishing between the two languages and using the right one in the proper place. As the verbal contingencies responsible for self-observation are better understood, the inaccuracies and limitations of that process will become more obvious. And those who have tried to resuscitate a science in mental life will have to abandon their claim to a privileged information about the inner workings of the human body. A science of behavior, human or non-human, is now well established. The direction of inquiry is clear. All that is needed, if psychology is to take its place with the other sciences, is less talk and more hard work. Thank you. This presentation is now concluded. Thank you.